Welcome back to another episode of What Are You Made Of with your boy, the unstoppable, the inexorable Mike Searock. I am in the house today with a gentleman. You guys, wait till you hear his story. Wait till you get to meet him. He's full of energy. He's full of passion. And we're going to dig in a little deeper into his story so you can find out the ingredients that have gone into making how he pains who he is, how he is known as the billion dollar brand builder. He is a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, icon, and pioneer. He is the founder of Logic E-Cigarettes, Stealth Fitness, and Think Billions, and I'm sure many other projects to come. Howie, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I love what you're doing. Uh, I love the initiative. It's super motivating. So thanks for having me. Well, man, you're welcome, and thank you for being here. And listen, we, we start the show off before I go. I have so many questions and so many avenues I want to take this conversation with, but let's ask the question we start the show with every time. What are you made of, Howie? Listen, I'll tell you, I made a steal. I go in hard. I'm like a ball of energy. You know, it started from when I was young. You know, when you're born smaller than everybody else, you know, you got to stand out and you got to push harder and you got to work harder. You know, if I was born 6'1", 6'2", I was 220, it'd be a different story. So, you know, back when I said to myself, okay, what am I going to do to make myself stand out? What am I going to do to help myself believe in myself? And uh, I'm made of three people. I, you know, not just three of these people I really looked up to. It's the ninja. I called the Bruce Lee. Yeah. You talked about it before. Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's incredible. And Tony Robbins. So these are three people I really sort of connected with for myself when I was younger to really just build myself into my own superpower. And of course, you're always your own best friend. So for me, you know, I say the man of steel, I, I started out in the gym when I was 12, 12 hitting the weights. And I think for me, you know, the gym was sort of my way of setting my goals, pushing myself hard, pushing beyond the pain. And I always say, you know, the gym is where all the magic happens for me that happened in my life where my strength came from. Yeah, there are experiences that shape us, right? You know, what you're made of is all the input, right? From when you're young to when you're older, all the negative, the positive, the, 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 the street battles you have, whether it's school, your parents, friends, bad partners, these all add up to who you are today. And for me, yep. and for me, this is, you know, these are the ingredients that make, that basically made me who I am, who I am today. And by the way, I thought about it on this long trip. I said, you know, what makes up Howie P? And I basically came up with five letters, my name, Howie, that was stamped on me since birth. So let me just tell you the five. Yeah, let's hear sort it. Of, let's hear it. Well, so, well, Howie, before you, before you go into it, I just want to let everyone know, he mentioned Arnold Schwarzenegger. Before we came on in the green room, uh, I gave Howie a little tip for when you're crossing your arms because, and by the oh, way, this oh, is a, oh, oh, yeah. this, this is an inside joke between uh, my, my partner in tech and me because he, he busts my chops all the time about my picture. So you got to put your yeah. hands underneath and push those. There you go. Yeah, there, there you go. go. So, so for everybody watching, you can see it. And for those of you listening, we're pushing our biceps up to make our arms look bigger when we cross our arms. So anyway, Howie, let's hear about the five, man. I, lo I love this. So did I lose you there? Okay. No, I'm here. So the cornerstone of my life, the H in Howie is for health. Health is well. I push it every day sleep, hydration, intermittent fasting, getting those, those hit workouts in, getting your steps or cardio in, right? So important, health, healthy choices. You know, like you said, I think you said, if you can't control the two feet around you, how can you control anything else? Is that one of your posts? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So basic, basically, you're, 100, you're, you're the most important real estate walking around every day. You might as well take the best care of it because it's to be with you a long time. So the H is for health. Health is well. The O, this is an important one. I tell people whenever I'm coaching them, inspiring them, you got to be your original self. I say, be you, be real, be proud. Look in the mirror and appreciate that special individual that you are. And that originality will bring out your success. You could take tips and tricks from other people, but stay yourself. Stay true to yourself. So originality is key. Don't be the guy to the left. Don't be the guy to the right. Be that guy right in that mirror. And be proud. 
The W is for work. I've been working since I'm 12 for the last 40 years hard in the gym, out of the gym, whether it was in, in school, grabbing someone's sheet of paper to get the answers. That was hard work too. <laughs> um, <laughs> hard work, whatever it took. You know, when I was 12, other kids went to camp. I was a laborer. I actually liked doing heavy labor. I was digging ditches for the, uh, the local builder uh, for these decks on these condos they were building. So I'd go with my, my, uh, my lunch thermos and my, uh, my lunch bag. And these dudes were working the job, big dudes with pickaxes. And I could barely pick the thing up. But, uh, you know, this would shape me. And hard work, dedication, and putting the work in 24-7, I mean, the, the clock never shuts down for me. So when you think you can hack work and you can sit under a tree and make a lot of money, you can't. And that's just the reality, at least my reality. Whatever my reality is, is what I believe. Yeah. The I, the I is for innova innovation. You've got to be innovative. Um, so when I was 14, I built my first motorized skateboard. It was a regular skateboard with a, a BMX fork on it and a uh, one of those uh, little mini bike uh, tires. And then we had this bumble bike motor, this gas motor. We just <laughs> tied it on. And then I ran uh -huh. and jump started it and I, and I was beating mopeds around the block. <laughs> so that was the first thing, you know, I, I innovated this sort of motorized skateboard. I don't even know at the time they, they had motorized skateboard. And then in 1999, I, uh, I combined the idea of a medicine ball and a barbell system called the energy ball it was the world's first functional medicine ball system with a handle that snapped in and out for balance, stability. You could do ax chop, chops. It was basically based upon squatting, lunging, bending, twisting, pushing, pulling, six primal movements. And I did six different videos. So that was a system I developed, which was very innovative and way ahead of its time. I was doing functional before anyone even was talking about functional. And then basically, I, when I, uh, I skipped to college, went to college, was a business major. We're still on innovation. Let me go to E. I'll go to E, and then I'll, okay. I'll, then okay. I'll go back to the innovation. But okay. E is for energy, being energized, positive, giving compliments to people around you, pushing them, uh, inspiring people, having good things to say, treating everyone as equal, even though it's not always easy when you're mad or you're in a bad mood. I mean, when you put that good energy, it comes back. You know, you said... I love helping people. I was a personal trainer for 22 years. My life, whoever's watching, my life was spent, is spent in the gym. I spent from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m., six, seven days a week for 22 years in a gym. And in between that time, I had like 29 failed startups, Mike. 29, they're not really failures. They're all learning experiences. But the millions of dollars that I had made over the years it wasn't even probably a million maybe it was a million five. i don't even know how much it was it wasn't a lot i mean i never had a business that broke a million dollars my personal training business never broke a million the crazy thing is you talk about rocket fuel right i took it i took a business that i had and went to another business after 29 failed attempts that i skipped the millions and went to billions <laughs> i skipped i skipped the whole step like a huge step so i had a lot of rocket fuel um, and my story is crazy because, you know, uh, I spent so much time in the gym and training people and coaching. My whole world is about basically helping people be better for themselves. You know, I tell people when I train them, I not only coach you, I inspire you. I make you feel better. You're more confident. You go out, you make more money. I'm better than your psychologist, your doctor, your, your lawyer that spends the charge you 400 an hour. I'm better than all of them combined. And you only pay me 150 at the time, whatever it was. I yeah, go, you get the yeah. biggest, you get the biggest deal with me. I give you so much value. I think helping other people is the greatest gift you can do. And to do it for free is okay. You know, and to charge is okay too. And it's, so I, I love helping others and making introductions. And like you said, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't look for anything for it because you know what? It's a good, great gestures. Just always come back. And, and for me, when I do a good deed and money is great, but it's never going to make you happy. I'm here to tell you 
no matter how much you make, 10 million, 20 million, 100, a billion dollar, $10 billion exit, it's not gonna make you happy. You may be able to buy some toys, but if you wanna be happy in your heart, it's what you do with your passion. Is. And, and my passion is really helping people, inspire them. And I'm glad you, you got me on your show because that's what you do and uh, help people reach deep in themselves to see you know, what really inspires them and you know, how they could be their best self. Yeah. You know, Howie, what you just said about the money, like I, uh, there was the uh, mega millions that just went over a billion. I think it was 1.2 billion the other couple of weeks yeah. ago. And I yeah. told my wife, one person wanted, and I said, oh man, I hope to God that person's prepared. Like, I hope they're prepared because money, and especially when it comes in a windfall like that, that you're not really working for can absolutely ruin your life. And, you know, we've seen it over and over again with lottery winners and, and athletes, right? Athletes, especially, man, like they, they get this windfall of money. And then if they're not prepared, they're done, man. And I, I just like, I said a little prayer, told my wife, I was like, man, I hope that person is, is prepared for that. So let's, 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 uh, let's, let's take a step back and look back at your, you know, you, you started down to professional training or, you know, uh, training people. I have a trainer at the gym. I, I, I love my guy, Dan, shout out to Dan. He's the one that uh, gets these. these yeah. Muscles. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but like, but where did it all start before that? Like when you were younger, when you were 12, like back then, how, how was family life? Like, did you have, did you grow up in a, 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 a solid fat ho- household? Or was there trouble? Any, any, any catalytic moments when you were younger? So, you know, I, uh, I grew up in a middle-class family. My mother was an entrepreneur, you know, she was always into fashion, retail, she had her own jewelry business, clothing business. My father actually worked with her family. My mother's family was in the trucking business. And my grandfather had come over as an immigrant. But my, my, family, my family life was, was, was fairly good. You know, I came from middle class and I saw what, you know, basically, you know, hard work. My mother was a hard worker and I saw the money she earned and she could treat herself to nice things. I said, you know what? I, I want that freedom. You know, I want to be able to make big money someday. And, you know, I, I was always uh, the type of person interested in, I, I, I always was interested in doing something and earning something. For me, I grew up around it. My grandparents, they were in the trucking business. I called the gangster business back when. And uh, they, uh, I used to go there on the weekends or some weeknights. And basically I'd be doing stamps, uh, the telex machine. They teach me. I was loading trucks on the weekend, but I had a good family life. I have a brother, younger brother and sister, you know, and we're, we're really tight, all of us. So I uh, went to private school, went to uh, a Hebrew Academy that actually started in a trailer. My grandfather was, you know, a big, uh, you know, advocate of giving back to Israel. And he came here from Poland. He, basically came as an immigrant, started as a street cart vendor and actually built a, built a, uh, a route by delivering uh, mail in his, uh, in his fruit truck and then built it up where he actually bought a truck and then started growing bigger and bigger and got into the, uh, what's called the GOH business. It was garment on hangers. So he was in the garment business. Okay. And basically, you know, he, he, uh, he had this initiative to put together a, a Hebrew school and that's where I went to school. I went to school in the trailer, you know, in like six towns over from me. And there was like five, six kids in my class. And then where, he eventually where, where, built this. Where was that? Where was that? Where, in New Jersey. Okay. In New Jersey. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I basically grew up around the same kids for eight to 10 years that were sort of like my family, you know. I yeah. never, I was at a small private school that started out in a trailer. And then we went to a bigger school. And then basically ninth grade. Went to high school, public school. I was like, holy shit, this is the Wild West. And uh, then I uh, went to Syracuse for four years, was a business major, got out, did training. Um, crazy story is, you know, which uh, Alexa and I told you is I was doing this training 22 years, had 29 failed businesses, and back in Basically, 2010, which is 10 years ago, I was 600000 in debt going through a divorce. And, you know, when you're going through divorce and basically where my gym was, 
I had the lock on training. I was in Livingston, New Jersey. Equinox open, Lifetime Fitness open. These monster competitors started opening around me. And it just, you know, put a real, a real buckle on my business that I had yeah. for many, many years. Plus, I had other, other companies I was starting up. I had an energy shop for gamers, health and fitness search engine, uh, tattoo T-shirts. You, you name it. We were just doing everything. Beach Butler, this cart for the beach. And then, so 2010 rolls around, had all these failed startups. I was basically at my wit's end. And I had come across in the e-cigarette in California with a group of guys that we were there for actually mixed martial arts meeting, bringing MMA to the Shaolin Temper, Temple, American style training um, to China. And these guys that were my friends, I, I actually put the meeting together to try to get like a half a point in the deal. But we're sitting at this table in Beverly Hills outside some restaurant. Some guy pulls out an e-cig. He's blowing smoke in my face. I go, dude, why are you smoking? My biggest pet peeve, Mike, is smoke. I hate smoke. Never liked hanging out. I, I don't drink. I don't smoke, do drugs. I was never into any of that stuff. I was just big into health and fitness since a young age, like I said. He's blowing the smoke, and then he goes to burn my hand. I'm like, dude. What is that? He goes, it's the future, cancer-free smoking. And I don't know if you've ever had these moments in your life or had a moment, but I was mind blown. Like at that moment, I said to myself, holy shit, this is what I'm going to do next. You know, this is the kind of mind I had. I was open. I was open to yeah, ideas. Yeah. I was open to growth. I had this vision of myself like being this monster business mogul my whole life between watching Bruce Lee watching Arnold in the gym, taking martial arts, building myself up, listening to Tony Robbins, reading his books. I fed all this into my mind. I wanted to be, you know, the best of the best, beat everybody out. And this has always been deep in my soul. So when I, when I, when I heard this, I was like, damn, this is it. This is going to be the big one. Now, 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 Howie, let me stop you. Let's remember where we stopped yeah. here. Cause I want to hear the story. But when you have that feeling, cause I have that too, I still have it. Um, for the longest time that I had it caged up and, yeah. and I was invalidated by the surroundings that I allowed in my, I, I allowed myself to be invalidated by the surroundings that I kept my environment. I talk about this a lot, the people that you allow in your environment and maybe some of the failures that I've had and all this. And I started to introvert rather than extrovert that feeling inside. Can you describe that feeling a little bit when, when it's not being oh. satisfied? That's, that's good. That's good. I, I, I like that. I like that. You know, I think I had this deep. I mean, this feeling for each failed attempt, each company you start that doesn't work and people like that's a stupid idea. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, wh why would you do something like that? I mean, as you know, my, like, this is thousands of repetitive negative remarks that build up. I mean, I'll tell you what the guy said at the table when I told him about the e-cig, but basically like how you, 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 people would say, you're, you're a muscle guy, dude. Just stick to the gym where the muscle heads are. I'm like, listen, I got a good idea. They're like, ah, you're, you're, this one failed, that one failed. I, well, you lost money in this one. You know, it's just, you're just not a, you're not an entrepreneur. You're just a fitness guy. Just stick to your training, you know? And that shit does build up. Like it builds up like a volcano ready to erupt. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, for me, I don't know if I would ever be on drugs, but I think if you have high stress and you ha internalize a lot of these feelings, going to the gym and working out is your best medicine. Yeah. Agreed. Your best medicine, your best mental health for sleeping, for just your being happy, getting, getting, the, getting the, 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 your happy vibes going. For me, that's been like my, my temple, you know? Yeah. So you're right. It builds up. It builds up and you want to you want to prove yourself. You want to show the world that you're not a failure, that you can do it. Yeah. And did you have um, the feeling? That, did you and did you did you have the feeling ever before you before you hit it with this these companies, uh, especially the e-cigarette one? Did you have the feeling that, man, I'm, where I am today, the scoreboard is the scoreboard, right? But I feel like I should be so much further along than I am financially, success-wise, 
what am I missing? What don't I know? What piece of the formula do not, do I not have? Like, did you go through that at all before you, before you got with the e-cigarette? You know, I think on a daily, I was always pressuring myself to do better. You know, how can I be better? How can I do more? Um, you know, and, and when you have a failed marriage, that feels like, you know, you failed all around. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your, yeah. Bro- your business is going under. Your marriage failed. And then what are your kids thinking, right? And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. It's like, you know, at that point, you know, it, you're at a breaking point. Like I was, I was like five feet under from six feet, just feeling really bad. And it, feel, it feels like that's the end. Like you can't start over at that moment because you're in it. I always talk about being a, the, the closer proximity you are to an adversity or setback, the worse it feels. There's no light at the end of the tunnel that you can see. But my thing, and I have a saying, I don't know if you know this one or not yet, but thrust is a must. Like I yeah, say, I saw that. I, I saw that. I saw that when I was looking at your book. Thrust is yeah, a must. Yeah, yeah. You got to go. Like when you're in that, what you just went through, 2010, I guess it was, when you went through that, what you just described, you have to, all you got to think to yourself, because nothing else matters at that point, because you can't see anything else. It's chaos, confusion, dark. Yep. Thrust is a must. You got to go. Yep. And uh, so, yeah. So I, I, so I'll let you take you back to that story. But yeah, I just wanted to dig a little deeper there. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was go time, you know. And so when I, when the guy had walked, I said, "Give me, a, can I have a sample of that e-cigarette? Let me have a sample of that." So the guy had walked away, and uh, I had asked the three, the three guys. One guy was Richie, and two other guys. I said, "Guys, I, I need ten grand." They're like, what do, "What do you mean you need ten grand?" I go, "Did you hear what the guy was saying next to me? E-cigarettes, dude. This is the future. Cancer-free smoking." And exactly what they said is, this is your problem. You have ADD. You're not paying attention to the meeting. We're not even here for that. Are you crazy? I go, no, guys, I'm telling you, this is the next fucking big thing. Excuse my French, guys. That's this is the next This is the next big thing. I was like freaking lit. And by the way, these guys, and, and by the way, the one guy that was there, his mother smoked for 60 years and quit off logic. Oh my and God. to this day, and to this day, he, you know, the guy, Richie, is like, dude, Dude, you're like the, it's the most unbelievable story. I mean, I have hundreds of friends that are successful. He goes, it's unbelievable. I go, dude, I told you this was going to be it. So I take a bunch of samples back from this meeting. And this guy said to me, you could private label through me. Anyway, I went, I was researching through China. I was trying to get samples from different manufacturers, which I did. And then I'm sitting there for three months smoking these things, saying to myself, how the hell am I going to know what's good product? So I'm driving to my place, and there's Eli. Eli, I call him Eli the hairdresser. He owned the salon next to me, his wife, Yana, great people. He was smoking Marlboro every day. Uh. He told me in the Israeli army, they give you a pack of Marlboro and a uniform. And so Eli was walking down the hall past my gym. I showed him it. And he goes, I, I, I said to him, he goes, what is that, electronic cigarette? He goes, I tried that 2008. My wife bought me a kit, $250, step one, step two, step 20. I never graduated the eighth grade. I took it out, put it back in the drawer, never looked at it again. I go, Eli, imagine Susie goes to 7-Eleven every day, buys a cup of coffee and our brand. I pitched it as our brand, me and him, right? He takes it. I remember this vividly, Mike. It was unbelievable. He takes it. He smokes it. Lights it up. Lights up. He goes, this is fucking gold. Let's cash it in. (laughs) And then in the back of the gym, we rented a little space. And in the side of the gym, I had a little area. We started going to work. We, We put together 10 grand each. And we went store to store, mouth to mouth. We, we ordered 5,000 units. We turned it. He was selling it out of the salon. I was wearing lanyards. I would leave at 4 a.m., come home at 11, have people trying him. Oh, you like Marlboro? Here, try Logic Black Label. Oh, you like menthol? Try Black Label menthol. Want to talk about guerrilla marketing? I found out that in the convenience stores, the big, one of the biggest challenges was how do people choose the right e-cigarette? And I said to myself, I know how they're going to choose the right Logic. I'm going to write the kind of cigarette on the box. I wrote Marlboro, Marlboro Light, Newport. Dude, it was unbelievable. 
the guy, Pat, you like Newport? Oh, take this one. And we built it up. We broke, a, I mean, it was unbelievable. We broke a hundred million in sales. It was me and him to the end, 50-50. We had a 60,000 square foot facility in Pompano. We moved from New Jersey to Pompano. It was either Puerto Rico, which he almost killed me to go to Puerto Rico because he told me laying my head down, we'd make 30,000 extra each, each day. We'd just sleep. Right, right, he right. Goes, just sleep. He, go, he goes, just sleep real nice and make, make an extra million a month. I'm See. like, I, I don't want to go to Puerto Rico. I was looking at all the schools for my young kid. And then we, uh, we got the 60,000 square foot. I set up this whole facility in Pompano Beach. You know, we, we, we manufactured, when I say we manufactured ourselves, we went to, I lived in China. I was living in China a month, two at a time, coming back two weeks to see my kids, and then back again over three and a half years. So I was back and forth to China, Newark to, to Hong Kong. I mean, I just transformed myself into this monster of a business guy. It was unbelievable. They rolled out the red carpet for us, the dinners, this, that. The first, the first six months, we were going in the back of the plane, scrunched between people. And then six months later, we're on Cathay Pacific first class eating caviar. Jeez. So, so how did you know what to do in China or who to connect with in China or how to set that up in the first place? Like who guided well, you with that? So I had some experience with manufacturing for my energy ball in Taiwan. Okay. So I, ha I had some experience doing some manufacturing over in China in the past and then worked with some other people on some other projects. So I had some knowledge of China and manufacturing, but we had to learn, you know, we had to go, we went there, they, they picked us up at the airport. We had to inspect my, my partner was from Israel. He was hardcore. Uh, hardcore military guy. He had a he had a uh, a background in like bioengineering and and uh, electrical bio bioengineering. But we figured it out. I mean, I tell people we had no experts, no consultants, no this, no that. We just we we were holding up pictures, drawing our freaking logo. It was like it was ridiculous. Was there any was there any moments of like setback or or like doubt that, through that process? Because it sounds like this thing just took off like it was a machine like we were just i mean yeah we had we had parts in uh in the business where you know setbacks with big manufacturing or some recall or this or that but as far as like momentum and growth we just were just it was a rocket it was like ro rocket ship you know rocket fuel it was just it just kept churning and we never had any lines of credit no credit cards we were collecting, we were collecting money from big companies. We'd ACH their account, Mike, the day before for the money, like tobacco company. That's how in demand our product was. Jeez. And then, yeah. So we were in China. We had three factories. Um, we, we actually developed our own cartridge that we patented um, in the uh, Logic Pro. We were just, you know what? We were hardworking. And, you know, we always say the harder you work, the luckier you get. And we just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Uh, oh, so what was cool was I actually, this is a good tip. And, and you know what? I don't really give this tip out, but I actually trademarked the words, the most trusted brand. Imagine that. I trademarked wow. those words. Wow. Yeah. yeah. People are like, that'll never get approved. Because I said, you know what? I don't have market studies. I don't have research. I don't have this shit. I, don't, I, I can't afford that stuff. I'm just going to claim it's the most trusted brand by trademarking it. And I got it. <laughs> and on 2000 taxis in New York, it goes the most trusted brand, Logic, electronic cigarettes. Every radio station. I was the first one to get uh, Logic on a Z100. Yeah, I, I, I've seen is, all that. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they used to go, Logic, the most trusted brand in electronic cigarettes. And I used to go, shit, that's my brand. Holy smoly. Um, yeah, so it was unbelievable. You know what? And, and when I created, when we created Logic, and then, uh, you know, we had the exit. Uh, I, uh, Goldman did, did my deal, you know. Uh, people say how much. I say it was a nice bag of cash. It was an all-cash deal. We sold to Japan Tobacco. And then, you know, I was really out of my sweet spot of fitness. And wait a minute, I, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to cut oh, you off, but, yeah. but, but we got to yeah. ask, hold yeah. on, let's go back for a minute. Cause 
How did you decide to exit? Like what, what made you decide to exit instead of keep going? Okay. I love it. You have good questions. So besides this going on in the company, you know, when there's so much money and partnership, not everyone agrees to everything. Yeah. And you know, we had, we had a, we had a, you know, it wasn't easy when there's a lot of money, you know? Yeah. People's minds change a little bit. And, sure. uh, and so, you know, with regulations, right. With regulations for FDA coming out and testing, um, that was required for this, by the way, like recently, I think logic was the second company to get approved by the FDA, you know? Okay. So logic still number three in the world brand right now, which I'm pretty proud of. Did they, did they get um, into cannabis or, or marijuana THC at all? Or is it only no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so, but I don't okay. think so, but they, they spent a hundred million on, on getting approval from FDA. That was like, gotcha. the fee. damn. Um, yeah. So, so then, so uh, there was, and, a, there was some conflicts and then, and then, yeah, the but, ex- but it was, a, it was, a it was, a you know, it was sort of a, it was sort of a deal week that, you know, you give it a deal, you can't refuse. And we were, you know, it was time. Now, were you shopping it or did they offer? No, no, we were shopping it. We shopped okay. it to uh, with Goldman. Yeah. Yeah. Gold, yeah. Goldman had Goldman had clients and we, we, we had it on the, on the, on the sales block. Okay. And then, and then, uh, yeah, we, the- we, we were, de- we were definitely the prettiest girl on the dance floor and we had the hottest company. And what was the process like from when you put it out, put it up there till, till closing? Was it like, you know, did they, did they check everything? They pull hair, everything like, was it so, stressful? Or? So, uh, oh my God. So the good thing is we had this guy, Miguel Martin, who's actually the president of, um, he's now the CEO of, I think, one of the largest cannabis companies in the country. They're public. They're a a Canadian company. So he was our president, Miguel Martin. He was the CEO of sales and marketing for Philip Morris. We brought him on board board as a president. So at the the closing with the data room and Goldman, let me just tell you, Mike, to sell to Japanese, to sell to a Japanese sixty billion dollar firm, you have to be so clean. Your books have to be so clean. Everything has to be perfect in order to get that sale. Yeah. And it was the process was uh, it, it was mind blowing how thorough they were. There were at least 30, 40, 50 thousand customer inquiries about the product they went through every inquiry every customer service response they had teams descending on every part of every charger every uh, all the nicotine testing it uh you know how many you know whatever the, the returns were the batteries what the battery power was i mean there were there were some key ingredients that i could share with everybody in the simplest form of, you know, how he, why was logic so successful? And, yeah. you know, I really thought about it and I gave a recent, uh, uh, a recent presentation in a mastermind and uh, some of the key ingredients, believe it or not, the one thing was, our one thing that we really focused on was every logic worked when a customer took it out of the package. Imagine the simplicity of that. Think about it. Every logic work every time they took it out of a package because it's electronic. Cigarettes will always smoke, but electronic cigarettes, the defective ratio was huge. Yeah. And we air shipped most of our products. So, and we, well, we did a process called aging the batteries where we actually tested the batteries for 30 days. And if they lost a certain amount, we would, uh, there's grade A, grade B, grade C. There's different genetics. Like in your iPhone, some of them will last longer than others because of genetics of the battery. So we would do this 30 day age testing. We would distill the oils a special way. So number one was logic had to work. Seems simple, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and number two, number two was you had to have the best experience, which was the richest flavor and the thickest vapor flavor and vapor. Think about that. So, yeah. These are things we, we, we focused on because we knew this is what most important to smokers and customers when they got our product. And we really focused on that. And that was all part of like quality control, you know, and going yeah. there and testing the product. And believe it or not, 
it's not funny, but in the beginning when they were hand making all our products, there was actually a human puffer there at the end. They put a tip on it, test every e-cigarette that was Jeez. coming off the line. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Like every week Holy there's a new shit. guy. I'm like, did that guy die or what? What? No, but but so, no, but uh, it, it cr- well, crazy. So how when when you went to exit, you were already making more money than you'd ever made in your life, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we so, were uh, yeah, we were writing huge checks. I mean, listen, even the first six, after six months, we were taking you know. 40, 50, 60,000 every month. Then I was like, and then we'd sit in the back room. We'd look at each other and go, uh, I go, Eli, well, how much are we going to take this week, this month, this month? Yeah. And he goes, ah, let's take 400,000 each. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Yeah. Was, so you, was un- was a- so the, so the sale of the company, the exit didn't change you financially as far as your daily life, really. Right. Because you were already making enough money that you had enough money daily. Like I'm sure that it changed over the, the legacy for your legacy and your family's legacy. But um, so really when you started making the money where you took 400,000, let's say one time, right. What, 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 how did your life change or what did you start to focus on investment wise or lifestyle wise when you started really making money? You know, believe it or not. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a simple, I, I say I'm a simple guy and people laugh, you know, you're driving Lamborghinis, Ferraris, you got a McLaren P1, I go, yeah, I mean, I bought the cars, but, you know, my, my life didn't change. Like, I'll go to a restaurant, and I wouldn't spend $80 on a fish, Mike. Yeah. Like, I was, I was just set in a discipline where I saved my money. I, I didn't I, – I was just saving the money. I wasn't putting the money into, into anything. Now, s- smart, stupid, and different, it doesn't matter. Like, I was just saving my money up. I wasn't buying stocks. I was just – focused on logic. I didn't want any distractions. It was a hundred percent focus. I just, just kept it away, putting it in the bank. It wasn't even covered in the bank, but just kept putting it in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. So I was doing no other strategies. My, my, in my mind, all I want to do is build this to the world's largest brand, which we were number one per sale. Uh, we were, we were number one pe- per um, sales per point of distribution in 2015 we were number one in the u.s and um uh, by nielsen data and we uh that's when we exited 2015 so then you know my my so my lifestyle you know i i we uh we celebrated um in 2013 we both he bought a rolls drop head i bought a ferrari uh uh 458 spider so we drove to work in those, you know, so that yeah. was like level that was leveled up. But I was still renting a condo. I was living in a condo 4000 a month. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and my That's, buddies that- are like, dude, if you would have bought houses back then in Florida, you know how much you would be worth now. I'm like, I, I, I don't look back. I only look forward. Right. Nobody makes all the right decisions. Yeah. So after the exit, what was the first week or month after the exit? Because your focus was on logic for so long. And now you had an exit, which is uh, obviously a chunk of money came to you all at once, or maybe I don't know how it was structured, but nonetheless, you weren't focused on logic anymore. What was that first week or month or so after like, you know, I'm trying to think back, but, um, you know, like you said, the person that won the lottery, you know, and yeah. I was like, you know, I knew Goldman was going to be one of my advisors because they're the one that helped me with the deal, you know? So they were, yeah, yeah. They, they were waiting. But you know that I didn't – crazy thing. Um, when they transferred that money into my bank, that money did not move for, I think, a year, Mike. <laughs> a year. I didn't want to transfer anybody. I was afraid it would get lost. I was so paranoid that I was, like, holding on for dear life. Isn't that and crazy you know that money has that power over us? Oh, my God. It's, you know, it took time. It, it took, it took time, you know, now, now I'm, I'm ready for the next one and I'm, I'm much more seasoned, but it was like a deer in the headlights. You yeah. know, the day, yeah. the day I heard, you know, the wire, co- you know, we, uh, we were at fresh fields in New York, which is a, uh, European law firm. They're, they're big. And they represented Japan tobacco. And I remember being in a boardroom and we closed the deal and signed and they were wiring the money. It was like a dream. And I remember for six months, I'd go into 
my president's office, Miguel, next door. I go, Miguel, what, what are the chances are we closing? What are the chances? Where, where are we at? I always like to, every month, we're to go, is, are we going to have higher or what? Because <laughs> he was working on all the pieces of the puzzle for the due diligence, yeah. communicating with the Japanese, uh, you know, closing team. And I was just making sure, you know, <laughs> everything was still running. You know, everything's running smooth because you never know what could happen. 100%. Well, look, I, I took you over time. I just want to end on this. What is, what is the idea behind Think Billions? And what do you have? Like, what's the vision for that? So we can end on that because we're talking about there's an event coming in October, uh, Think Billions event out in Palm Desert. I believe it's your place, right? In Palm Desert? Yep. Being held at your place. Yep, yep. And uh, I, yeah, I, so you want to tell us about I, that? I, 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 yeah, I bought a castle in, uh, in Cali in the desert. And Think Billions is all about the ability to think beyond being a millionaire. How can you become a billionaire? What does it need to take? What are the, what, what is, what is the thinking process, right? What's how, how can you make deals like a billionaire? And, you know, what are people doing at the billion dollar level that could really help you open your mind to thinking billions. And so when I skipped the million mark and went to billions, I said, you know what, I got to get everyone thinking about billions because you know what? I was thinking millions and I skipped that mark. So I think thinking billions is a good idea. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's possible for, I think it's possible for anyone. And basically it's taking a lot of my advisors and my team that I rely on daily and bringing them together under one roof. In addition to other great uh, entrepreneurs that have built very large brands, you know, billion dollar brand builders, million dollar brand builders, and experts in all different areas of health, wealth, mindset, you know, private equity, venture capital. We're going to have it all covered. So it's a great place to really learn, grow, and, you know, get your rocket fuel going with yeah, these billions. Yeah, let's huh? go. Let's go. I love it. Love it. So what's, but what's the vision for the future of it besides this event? Like, is it, a, is it, you have like the vision for what you want to get out of this is this going to be like numerous events? Is it going to be, how, how is it going to be? Yeah. So right now we're, uh, we're looking to do a continuing education. We're working on that, on that part of it for all different level entrepreneurs and basically just extracting out of me everything that I've done and built my businesses with, which by the way, I didn't even talk about stealth fitness, but we'll have to do that on another one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. another, that's another billion dollar brand to be but really extract everything out of Howie that really has helped me grow and become who I am today and put it into a course like you, like you've done with your blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, I love it. Yeah. So I'm super pumped and uh, we'll see where it takes us. But right now we got the event October 21st, 22nd, 23rd. I know you're going to be there. It's going to be amazing and it's going to be very limited, very exclusive. So make sure you get your tickets soon. I love it, man. We'll make sure that uh, we have that link in the show notes. Howie, listen, man, you know, I got to tell you, you're a down to earth dude. Uh, I love talking to you. And uh, I didn't know you before today, except for us just chatting on Instagram and Alexa, shout out to Alexa for uh, connecting us, man. And I look for, you know, look, I, I think that I can help yeah. big time in, uh, in think billions and I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you, brother. I appreciate you being here and being so down to earth with us, man. Thanks, I, I appreciate you too. I think you're awesome. I love what, I love what you're doing and uh, you're, you're, a, you're a true professional and keep it up. And I know you're helping a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you, Howie. I appreciate you. You guys have been listening to the What Are You Made Up podcast with your boy, Mike Searock, the Unstoppable. And dude, listen, if Howie did that many startups until he got to the one, he's unstoppable too. He's definitely in the Unstoppable Club. I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. If you did, <laughs> leave a comment, rate us. And until next time, be unstoppable. Let's go. 